Tanakoto Katoa. Welcome to 2021. I'm sure the year ahead is going to be filled with a new set of challenges and learning experiences for us all. We are fortunate to see the fortnightly webinars continue, and tonight we open with a star presenter, the lovely Ben Harris. Yay! <laughs> ben is a medical microbiology scientist with an extensive career history in the diagnostic microbiology field. He is an honorary lecturer for the University of Otago and has given many presentations and seminars on an extensive range of topics. Everything I've seen myself from scabies to influenza, emerging antibiotic resistances and infectious diseases. Going back 11 months ago now, Ben gave our first presentation on COVID-19. And at that point, it was the record number of participants who joined that session at over 300 people and was the longest webinar to date. <laughs> Um, I am certainly interested to see what tonight holds in store for us and shall now hand you over to the lovely Ben. Thank you. <laughs> thank you very much, Cathy. As always, you give an overgloating uh, review, but thank you very much. And welcome New Zealand wide to all those participants that are, that are here again. I've got many, many slides, you'll be surprised, but uh, many, many slides as per usual. And I've tried to arrange them so the key ones uh, at the beginning, key ones that may be of more clinical use. And then I've got a lot of slides after that. So we just go through some things to be aware of. A number of slides uh, you may or may not have seen before. So I've included them for context too, but I'll start. Kathy, because I cannot see um, when you text messages in, I've um, asked Kathy, implored Kathy to interrupt me any time. So she's not um, interrupting the flow. I begged her to do so. So please keep the questions coming in and I'll start off now. Uh, thank you for your attendance and thank you to Mobile Health for, for providing the service overall. So the basics haven't changed since what we learned for COVID-19 back in about January, February, actually quite early on. Those age groups along the bottom most people under 50 are not at risk from COVID. That's one key point, although everyone tends to get worried. And even those mortality rates from the 0 to 9 year old, 10 to 19, 0.2, 0.2%, 0.4%, now we've got bigger numbers, even they have dropped quite a lot now that we understand the disease better. And the majority of infections are mild or severe, a lot smaller still, mild to severe, and an equal number, probably 40 to 60%, there's no symptoms whatsoever. They have the virus, they have the infection, antibody response, but no symptoms. So we need to keep perspectives. And there are certain risk factors which make the mortality rates even higher. They tend to be inflammatory. Inflammatory conditions, which happens as we get older, tend to be the biggest risk rates. So most people survive. Um, the vast majority survive actually, and uh, more than a number of other illnesses, which I'll come to lately, later. The basics, um, COVID is caused, of course, COVID-19, the disease is caused by the virus SARS-CoV-2, and it's a two-phase illness. There's the early viral response phase, when we actually get the infection, and then following that, especially for COVID, we have an inflammatory second phase. And it's that inflammatory phase that is a really, really hard one and much more so than influenza. It's the inflammatory rather than the infection itself that causes all the trouble. Most people get over, but there is emerging evidence um, that there's an increasing number of people that get uh, medium to long-term consequences, chronic fatigue, and such like issues. So the basics, um, the symptomatic and pre-symptomatic, that's those people that don't have symptoms yet, but will develop them. And we don't know who they are, of course. Um, so the symptomatic and those who are about to develop symptoms, pre-symptomatic, that occurs one to do two days before symptoms uh, have an onset. So the main transmission starts one to two days beforehand. And this is likely to play a greater role, the symptomatic and pre-symptomatic, than those that catch the infection but never develop symptoms, the asymptomatic ones. 
So pre-symptomatic or asymptomatic at the time, but then they later developed symptoms. <clears throat> but they're asymptomatic, catch the virus, lose the virus, and never develop symptoms. That's 40 to 60% of all infections. Um, then it's similar, uh, COVID or SARS-CoV-2 <clears throat> is similar to SARS, the um, infection we had some 20, 18 years ago or something, 2003. It's 80% similar in the genome, but it is 96% similar to the bat coronavirus and 96%. It's thought that there's likely to be an intermediary host, maybe a pangolin uh, anteater or something that, that's between that 96% and humans. Um, the main differences with SARS are the surface proteins of COVID bind a lot more to, um, uh, to the, um, those uh, spike proteins. They bind a lot harder. And the viral load kinetics, that just means we start being infectious with COVID, especially one to two days before we get symptoms through for five to seven days or so after we get symptoms. Unlike SARS, which we didn't start spreading the most symptoms until the second week of symptoms, the second week. So that meant when we isolated somebody with symptoms, they couldn't spread it so much. So that's a major um, difference. Um, moving on, uh, the PCR test doesn't is correlates with infectiousness. Uh, so they can detect the um, um, the SARS or COVID virus, if you like, in the upper respiratory tract for around a mean of 17 days, up to 83 days. Uh, so the PCR test can detect it. I'll come on to it often doesn't, but I'll come back on that. It can detect it. But the detection of this RNA, which is what is in the virus, does not necessarily equate to infectiousness. Detection PCR. So <clears throat> in viral cultures, which only grow when they're alive, whereas the PCR test detects dead or alive, the PCR being polymerase chain reaction, um, detects dead or alive, so in viral cultures, the culture is rarely positive beyond nine days of illness, rarely positive beyond nine days of illness, even though it may be detected for a maximum of 83 days, um, but, but it's likely to be dead at that stage. So a positive does not necessarily mean infectious at all. Um, PCR is often called the gold standard, but false negatives um, in other words, missed detections are far higher than people are generally aware, uh, far, far higher. And this is from uh, a um, meta-analysis study. Pre-symptoms, so before symptoms occur, the four days before symptoms occur, and symptoms are normally over five days, the false negative rate, in other words, the missed um, detections on PCR, um, decreases from 100% on day one. In other words, not a single one is detected on the first day of incubation of the virus before you get symptoms, to 67%, 67 out of 100 are missed on two days, uh, one day before you get the, um, one to two days before you actually get the symptoms. So you think back to isolation hotels and such like too. So a lot of people are not, not aware of that at all. 67 out of 100 are missed on day four of the incubation of the virus in a person. Missed detections. On the day of symptom onset, when we first get COVID symptoms, uh, the false negative rate it misses 38 out of 100 on the first day of symptoms. 38 out of 100 it misses on average on a meta-analysis study. So you're 18 to 65 misses decreasing to 20% on day eight, which is five days after the, um, three days after the symptoms onset. So 20 out of 100 are missed three days after symptom onset. A lot higher than people realize, 20 out of 100 on average. Uh, and that increases again um, from 21% misses on day nine, to 66% on day 21. So just it's 
so-called gold standard, but not as a, a tarnished, very tarnished gold standard. So the usefulness of it, <clears throat> we would like it to be 100%. <laughs> and all these people, so the, it's a bit like the, um, uh, dare I say it, the pap smears were. <clears throat> there may have been three or four over 15 years. That's because the detection rate, even by the best detectors, was only about 60% or so. So you had to do it three times to have a better chance of finding it. Uh, so PCR tests have limitations when used as a guide to decision making for individual patients. They're almost more useful on a population basis, but in New Zealand, we've got a different approach. Positive test, a positive test is nearly always guarantees COVID. There may be one in a thousand that it falsely causes COVID when it's not. Uh, but a positive test is very specific as the term. A negative test never ever rules out COVID. A negative test, for the reasons I've just explained, never ever rule out COVID. And this is the, um, I don't know, can you see my arrow there at all on the screen? Oh, you can, wonderful. Um, so this is the virus coming up and down. Most diseases, it starts five days before symptoms, and most diseases in the blue, uh, mild to moderate, bearing in mind most have no symptoms actually, at least half have no symptoms, but those that do, but the more severe illnesses uh, can lead to um, go on for longer and lead to severe or critical illness along the line with ICU admissions, et cetera, acute respiratory syndrome. So at the same time, we have the viral antigen and the viral RNA comes up as we've discussed, even though it misses or not. And then just as they're coming down, the blood serology for a start, the IgM followed a few days later by the IgG come up, the IgM comes down and the IgG lasts for a lot longer. That's just by, um, we don't use that very much, but the blood antibodies can be of some use. So when you do a test at the red line, is um, when the viral particles are there, the red lines of viral particles, do you do it at symptom onset? Of course, you don't know if it is or not. Or do you do it uh, the day after or the day of symptoms? But we saw how many that missed as well. Or do you do it every few days and do it on day 16, um, et cetera, et cetera. And we don't know where this person is through the process. So the NAAT test is the PCR test, nucleic acid amplification test, same thing. Okay, recovery time, medium time, mild cases, two weeks, severe or critical, three to six weeks. But then we can get these really long-term ones. And it's that inflammatory process after the virus is gone, basically, the inflammatory process that caused the trouble. And as I pointed out before, these are the underlying conditions and they all tend to be inflammatory type um, conditions, which make people at bigger risk still of worse infection and ultimately of mortality as well. Many of those, of course, are in older age, um, but not necessarily. Transmission capacity is a maximum in the first week of illness. That's when the most virus spreads. Uh, Severely ill and immunocompromised, that can go on for a lot longer and there can be intermittent shedding. It can find it and then not find it and find it and not find it. Makes it very hard if you're trying to rely, which you never should do completely on the, on the PCR test. And low level results, um, as we said before, they may not be infectious particles at all. They may have died weeks before. Um, it's very, very hard. Um, asymptomatic, individuals with and that are carrying the infection but no symptoms they can definitely be infectious to others and that's a real problem but their relative infectiousness is much reduced compared to those that do have symptoms or will begin symptoms the pre-symptomatic ones but we don't know who the pre symptomatic we, we cannot differentiate the pre-symptomatic from the asymptomatic until we know which ones go on to get symptoms are there any questions coming in yet, Kathy? <laughs> right. <clears throat> um, no, everyone's just astounded by you so far. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's interesting, isn't it? <laughs> Those with mild symptoms uh, and the pre-symptomatic ones, as I say, we don't know who they are yet, carry large amounts of virus in the upper respiratory tract, even though the PCR test may miss it. <laughs> uh, and they're a real risk for spreading. Um, 
and um, of course we have to rely on those bottom things in the yellow vaccination which we haven't got yet or will do shortly physical distancing, testing tracing all of those are going to have to be part of a package um, we cannot rely just on the pcr test they all have to be part of a package transmission also uh, most transmissions understandably are where the most viruses, which is close range. So somebody that's infected, whether they have symptoms or not yet, close range. So it's in general, the sort of rule of thumb, 15 minutes face to face and within two meters. That's, that's the highest risk. But if it's just got 50% more infectious, then that time's halved because we have the same number of particles <laughs> in seven minutes as opposed <laughs> to, and so when you're living in a household, that's more likely to happen. Um, and the household uh, where many, many of the infections are, somebody living in the same household, you're sharing the same air. And so, um, and the secondary rate is four to 35% in household members. So sharing the same air, we can just have those figures as the, the 50% more infectious ones come. Other high risk activities, uh, dining, of course, with infected person, sharing food, taking part in group activities. We sure that, saw those ones, I think, in our lockdown where workers, construction workers, had to keep two meters apart and yet they were sharing cigarettes, passing along, sharing cigarettes, makes a mockery. Um, enclosed environments, dare I say lifts as well. I mentioned that now before I forget it. I've got a sum. Um, who's in um, a quarantine hotel at the moment. And um, just remember with smoking, the virus spreading it is like smoke from a cigarette. If I was smoking a cigarette, that's a proxy for where the virus will be. The narrower you are to me, the more smoke you're going to be in contact with. So I said, uh, he's on the fourth floor of a hotel. And I said, when you go up, you go down the stairwell. And he said, no, you're not allowed to. You have to go down the lift. I just find that interesting. If you're smoking a cigarette, it's a proxy for viral particles. You walk out of your room, you go across the corridor. So you leave a whole lot of smoke in the corridor and then come back on that. And you get into this really confined space being a lift and you keep smoking. If you've got COVID, you're shedding the viral particles and you're not allowed to share it with anyone else other than your roommate if you have one. You go down the lift, you walk out, the lift doors immediately close are waiting for the next person to get in <laughs> and get, I couldn't believe, why wouldn't you go down a stairwell? Because there's far more spare air in a stairwell than in a lift. I was just staggered by it, actually. And just logical thinking. And then it's transpired that a number of the hotels, they turn the air conditioning off in the corridors, whether it's to save power or otherwise. So if you're smoking as you're walking to the lift, being the surrogate for viral particles, and the air conditioning's turned off, the smoke just stays there, as do the viral particles. Um, so, uh, and most super spreading events occur indoors. So there's one in Belgium recently where a Father Christmas went in to a rest home and infected something like 29 people. He had no symptoms. These are the standard ones. We know isolation, one to two meters, keep your distance, cough into the elbow. We know these. Mass air is key. Air is key, hand hygiene planes wear masks and the isolate, isolate. Just repeating this one, I think many of you have seen, if it was smoke, then you'd open an external window and it dilutes it out a whole lot more. And we're a lot more likely to get nearby particles. But if we had to say breathe in what used to be maybe one to 200 particles before we caught the infection, which may take 15 minutes there, now seven minutes with the 50% more infectious strains coming, uh, then we just have to spend a little bit longer over here before we pick up that same number. Um, and surfaces are important, but not as important as air. So that's the smoking analogy. And I think it's, it's a good one because it's something we can visualize. And so it's diluted by distance, external openings, and increasing air changes, for instance, in air conditioning and concentrated by small spaces, e.g. lifts and or a small room. I just mentioned for surfaces, there's now high tech. We know when there's manual surface cleaning in big institutions that often many things are missed. 
manual it's just when you put a little invisible uv marker on a wall on surfaces and go in after it's been so-called high level disinfection often they're still there they've never been wiped over people are busy and there are machines now which will fill a whole room with fog and totally sterilize it and they'll totally sterilize in 95 masks and the sterling cost is something like 1.6 cents each to totally sterilize a mask just along the line but that's another issue so once again here we have the illness course typical up down um, and fatal up further takes longer and you want to be somewhere <laughs> somewhere between those preferably so the incubation acute phase then those that go into the pro-inflammatory phase may be in trouble and um, we have um, influenza like symptoms fevers cough myalgias etc cetera, etc cetera. diarrhea is not too uncommon um, not too uncommon case fatality rate case fatality rate is a tricky one cfr case fatality rate and it's not constant and it changes with context uh, time place population etc uh, underlying illnesses and it's a little bit of a hard one to understand but for a start for instance if we'll say wuhan but it can be new zealand or anywhere else if a hundred people are admitted to hospital uh, because they're severely ill, 100 people have murdered, and say 30 of them die. The case fatality rate at that stage is 30%, 30 of the 100 die. But those that had symptoms and were at home aren't counted in that case fatality rate. <laughs> so what I'm saying is with time and awareness, anyone with symptoms and goes running out, jumps in their car and, um, and goes and gets tested, so the denominator compared to those that died keeps increasing as more gets tested. Then even those with a snivelly nose are encouraged to come in. <laughs> so they're included in the numbers. Then they may do a whole community, whether you've got symptoms or not. And so we double that again. So the case fatality rate for any new infectious disease tends to be a lot higher at the beginning and starts dropping with time, if that makes sense. Um, so we this put another way, the denominated deaths and compared to PCR positives in a hospital. But then when we start PCR testing in the community, the numbers increase. Then a month or two later, we may do antibody tests in the wider community. And so we realize the same number of deaths, we're always sure of the same number of deaths, but the total number is getting a lot bigger still. Then we do a harder test, might be T cells, and now that denominator has got a whole lot bigger still again. So that's why the case fatality rate keeps coming down. So here is case fatality rates in different places in China and note how they all, all drop down more and more and more with time. And that's understandable. Cumulative confirmed uh, uh, cases um, up here. So they go up, up, up with time. And we're now up to 100 million in the world confirmed cases there'll be a lot more unconfirmed and we'll note we have stronger figures for the actual deaths so they stay down around the one or two percent there compared to the confirmed cases which in other words the case fatality rate keeps dropping 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 um, and so it's a poor measure of the mortality risk of the disease here these ones are from south america mainly chile and note naught to nine year olds this is the case fatality rate as close to zero as you can get <laughs> for women until the 50 year olds and above it starts coming up 80 year olds it's getting up a lot higher still there's 40 percent down here a lot higher still but of course 80 year olds it's not uncommon to, to die anyway there's a natural mortality to think about same with males it's somewhat similar males might be very slightly higher but these low ones. So it's hard to know, do you say the average case fatality rate includes that and that, or do you delineate it out for the 0 to 50 year olds and then the 50, 60, 70 year olds? Right, and similarly here, this is a worldwide one rather than South America. So you said three different countries, um, two to three different countries here. The case fatality rate 0.11, so that's one in a thousand, one in a thousand two and a thousand, three and a thousand tiny. And, that, that's, and only when we get to 50 to 59 years, 60 to 69 years, does the case fatality rate 
keep coming out, 80 year olds, 14 or 15 to 20 percent, depending on the country here. Um, remembering the average age, yeah, most people die with COVID rather than of it, is what I'm saying. That's the final, final thing, like influenza that pushes us off the edge. The darker the red, the more. What's interesting, perhaps, is note Africa has been, other than South Africa, which is wealthier, most of Africa has been relatively little hit compared to industrial countries. And I have somewhat of a theory on that, including because they're poorer, they don't have as many medications as the rest of us, the wealthier countries other than South Africa, which does have more. They're very sociable people. Um, and the pet photo, I speak to 40 to 60,000 of them each week as it happens online. And um, very, very sociable. They're really wary of the West and vaccinations because they've been tricked into um, and or believe they have, and I think have been tricked into trials in the past, vehemently, vehemently against the whole thought of vaccinations and being tested as guinea pigs. Um, that's another issue. So the Solid line is, aver is the average uh, mortality of um, uh, men and the dotted line is women. And the COVID line is um, the COVID mortality rate. So it's um, actually not that different. I'm not saying COVID's a, a nice illness at all, but I'm saying when we look at it this way, it's not that different. And depending if it was a logarithmic scale um, or the linear scale, it's not that different in actual fact. So these are very much, these are the COVID deaths, uh, very much the same as the average death for those age groups and only above 60s, so it just coming up a wee bit more there compared to the average mortality rate anyway. We have 33,000 deaths a year or thereabouts in New Zealand, for instance, and um, that's normal. For instance, in the United States has a population about 328 million and you think, wow, they've got to 100,000 deaths when they first got there. Now that is only, and I don't like to use the term only because 100,000 is huge, 0.03% of their population, three per 10,000 of their population. Just being clear, 0.1% is one per thousand, 0 0.01, one per 10,000, 0.01, one and 100,000. So this was published in New Zealand Medical uh, Journal. Note the infection fatality rate um, which you don't necessarily have symptoms. You may have no symptoms but have the infection. For age group, it's infinitesimally small, <laughs> basically, as we come up, and only then does it start coming up a bit with the older age groups. Um, life expectancy, and we have Maori, Pacific, and non maori That's the average life expectancy there. So we have to factor that into these um, fatality rates as well. Um, by age, um, this is uh, world figures, this is age here, and infection fatality ratio. Note how actually small it is on, on a more worldwide population basis. Really, really small. I, I've just kept laboring that about, I know, but I just wanted to make sure we believe the media, which comes back to people that look at fake news believe what they read <laughs> so when we watch the news we tend to believe it well that's dreadful and it is dreadful but when we look at the stats it can be a bit um, different to what we think infection fatality rate not 34 and once again laboring it usa um so if we're around here 0.043 and um uh, for the other accidental fatalities um it's really, really quite small uh, on a level with COVID. What is an infection? Just go over that. Infections when we have symptoms, clinical symptoms, an asymptomatic infection. There's no symptoms, but you are carrying, whether it's hepatitis B or COVID, you're a carrier of it. So that may be detected, uh, the actual microbe, for instance, a PCR test or a culture. Um, if it was... Um, um, I don't know, bacterial one, Campylobacter uh, or Salmonella can be cultured, uh, but we will often see an immune response antibody. So we know they've had it, and most people that catch influenza every year in New Zealand, we know they've got antibodies to it, but they never develop symptoms to it. So that's subclinical infection. And this slide I think I've shown you before, but I think it's incredibly useful. Every different species 
has a number of microbes for that species, whether it's Campylobacter influenza or a number, where the average person, if they breathe in or ingest more than that number, the average person will get ill. That's called the infectious dose. Under that number, the average person will have an asymptomatic infection. They'll have an immune response, but no infection. So old milk, if you like, around more than a million per mil, the average person will get symptoms and get ill. Um, salmonella, the average person needs to ingest more than a thousand. 600, the average person will have no symptoms, but they'll develop immunity. Influ seasonal influenza, it's about 800 influenza virus, which is within generally within a meter of us when we're coughing. But small particles will go a lot further to the other side of the room still. And if you spend long enough there, you'll catch your 800 still. It'll just take a lot longer at the other side of the room. Capital back to 500, E. coli staph virus about 200. We don't know what the infectious dose is for COVID, Compared to, because we know how much more infectious it is than influenza, it's probably about 100 to 200 COVID virus before the average person succumbs. But that's just halved. If it's 50% more infectious, that's just, <laughs> it's come more like 50 to 100 perhaps now. Measles is 3 to 10 infectious dose. So that's really, really infectious, only 3 to 10. Norovirus is 10 to 20. Uh, but the source of norovirus, vomit or feces, has 1,000 million virus per tiny little gram of feces or vomit. So a bit of steam comes up from 1,000 million. It's not hard to ingest 10 to 20 or breathe in 10 to 20. And so just to make that point. And whereas, so what happens with asymptomatic, the microbe increases. If it went up to the red line, we'd get infection, clinical infection, I should say. Below the red line, it's subclinical, and our immunity, if it gets there in time, because we're vaccinated or otherwise, we never get infection, but we may detect the antibodies. Whereas with a clinical infection, the microbe gets above that magic line for that particular species, and we get a clinical infection, and we either die or our immunity pulls it back again and we recover. So just to make it very clear of that. The Rho Valley, which most members of the public now know lots about, which is fantastic, is the average number of secondary cases that we produce uh, when we're infected. So if we pass it on to more than one person or even 1.1 persons or one and a half people, then the epidemic will increase. And if the Rho Valley is less than one, the average person with that infection pass it on to less than one, the epidemic will decrease and wind itself out. So, and the row value is a useful evaluation of the transmissibility of the infectiousness of the disease. The smaller number of virus you take in, the faster it will spread. What's the row value for COVID? We don't know because there's so many other factors, including people get frightened, they wear masks, they wash their hands, they keep social distancing, but it may be around three, maybe around three, but it's just increased 50% <laughs> because 50% more infectious, maybe around three. So if somebody was to tell you there's a new variant, which has happened, there's a new variant, um, which has also happened, it seems to have the same mortality rate. Oh, that's a bit of a relief. <laughs> it's just more transmissible. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? So it's more transmissible, but luckily it has the same mortality rate. Is that less concerning? I'm gonna work through this slowly. 30% more transmissible causes more deaths than a variant with 30% higher mortality rate. Sounds a bit pickly, it's counterintuitive, but I'm going to work through this slowly to show you in, in your own time, you can come back if you wish. Um, variant one spreads, because we have done social distancing and masks, for instance, the row value might be one. So the average person passes on to one other. So 10,000 infected people will pass it on to 10,000 others in the first generation cycle. And they would in turn pass it on to 10,000 more and 10,000 more. So that's after 10 generations, 10 times 10,000 is 100,000 new infections at the row value is one starting with 10,000 infected people. At a 1% mortality, that 100,000 people would lead to 1,000 deaths. 
Okay, most important, 1,000 deaths. Variant 2 has a 30% higher mortality rate. So there's 1.3%, not the one that I said just before, 1.3%. Same transmissibility. So after 10 generations, there'll still be 100,000. But instead of 1,000 deaths, when it was 1% mortality, there's now 1,300 deaths, 1.3% 1 of 100,000. Hopefully you're with me. But we have another variant that's 30% more transmissible, but the same 1% mortality rate as the original one was. After 10 generations, because there's more than 1,000 every generation now, there's 4,200 deaths. 4,200 deaths. 30% more transmissible, but 1% of that much larger number comes to 4,200. I'm going to, the longer this continues, the death toll, the mortality uh, rate stays the same, but the deaths increase. I'll put this another way. When the row value increases infectious infections, the deaths go up too. If you've got a big enough, if you've got 100,000 infections, you have less deaths than if you've got a million infections. Row value of 2.6a, then after three phases, here's the first person, they give it to 2.6, that's the second phase. The third phase, we um, have 27 infected people coming around as it happens. So that's with a row of 2.6, 27 infected. Now we go to a row of 3.9, which is 50% higher, and we go through the same three generations, but we now have 77 infected rather than 27 infected. That's like happens in your savings account. You have so much money in there now, um, you don't know what to do with it because it's the power of um, exponential growth as all the bankers always say. So hopefully that makes sense. So 30% higher mortality over time, this is deaths over time, as opposed to 30% more transmissible which is the same mortality, it becomes much, much larger. Was that all right? <laughs> okay. Row value declines if part of the population is no longer susceptible to infection. So they may have caught and have immunity uh, from, or have vaccination, previously infected. They're doing transmission precautions, isolating masks, et cetera, social distancing, fair drives change. The row value will decline. Row value increases if there's a lower infectious dose, less numbers to cause an infection, and, um, and that increases the transmissibility, which is, um, uh, it spreads more. <clears throat> so the lower the infectious dose, the higher the row value, if nothing else has changed. And that raises concerns. If there's a bigger number, does, do the antibodies still work? vaccine or natural, do they still work? Our quarantine environment, we had compare, We had a few slip through the hotels in New Zealand and our um, MB hotels, managed isolation quarantines, few slip through, but now we'd expect 50% more to. It's just got 50% more infectious. <laughs> and so uh, everything needs to be doubled down a whole lot more. And um, Plus, as it's more infectious, it's had a uh, target for the vaccine. What, what is different about it to keep finding what happened? So key points for new variants. Is it more transmissible and or a higher mortality? And is that age group dependent? So is it changing from being the elderly to younger or not? It takes a while to get that data. Is the new variant able to evade vaccines? And we know the new variant is making the Oxford um, AstraZeneca vaccine look decidedly not nearly as good. We've bought something like enough for 3.8 million people and it's, it's looking decidedly not very good. Do, do you still have protection from the previous variant to this new variant? And it's not until we've had it for a while that we know and it looks as though you are more, the immunity from the previous one does not work as well for the new variant. Remember, the virus is fighting for its survival. Does it affect the PCR test detection? So it's a slightly different virus now. Does the test pick it up just as reliably, which wasn't very, just as reliably now as it did before? 
and uh, are there illness differences? Does it make people more ill even with the mortality rates the same? So a number of things to think about. And that can relate in a number of different um, outbreak type patterns that can occur. And you can give them various names, but uh, it's going to be a number of random things happen. New Zealand, this is the world COVID rates. And New Zealand, of course, we're ever more vulnerable as there's ever more cases in the world. And we can't uh, completely stop all the people coming to New Zealand. So the risks increases. This is the past track record of New Zealand of, of um, uh, popping up. We would expect there to be more in the community and as everything's really doubled down. Just to re-emphasize that when we flatten the curve, so to speak, there's the same number of total infections. We just have them over a longer period of time, so it's easier to manage. Longer period of time, easier to manage. And there are all these other reasons, fair isolation, pretty much if um, people come out of isolation, um, and then the second wave comes up again. So it may not even be, a, it's a behavioral wave, rather than we saw it in Europe, everyone party, party, parties, once the numbers come down. And then winter can make it worse still because people are closer together and the virus lives longer. So the first wave, then there's the psycho psychosocial impact. We know many, many people have mental health problems in the community anyway, let alone when we add this on. And then those that delay seeking help and there are many of those. All those hospitals and all those GP practices that closed down, it's um, what were they doing before if, if it, um, um, they're doing good medicine all the time. This is just the row values. So measles, as I said, was three to 10. So that's really, really infectious. The average person in a non-immune population will infect 12 to 18 others. Um, and we come down, the 1918-19 influenza strain was thought to be about two to three people. And we're more around this range here for um, two to five, maybe for the COVID one. This one's a bit tricky, but I want to spend some time. You now know these row values relate to infectiousness and the, more, the lower the infectious dose, the more people spread to. So we'll look at around three to four, uh, perhaps for, um, for COVID now with the new strains. If we were to think of influenza, row value might be 1.1. The average person passes on to one and a tenth more people. If we had a vaccine that was 100% effective, we would only need to vaccinate 10% of the population to drop that 0.1 down to one or a bit less. So the, so the, ep the epidemic, influenza epidemic started decreasing. That makes sense? So if there's 1.1, we just need to drop it down below 10%. If we had a vaccine that was 100% effective, you'd do 10% of the population. In fact, the influenza vaccine is only about 60 to 70% effective for under 65 year olds. So we have to do about 17% of the population. But over 65 year olds, it's only about 20% effective. So then we have to, suddenly we're coming up to do um, um, at least 50% of the population to get herd immunity. Now, we are incredibly lucky to have 95% effective vaccines, the Pfizer one, um, uh, AstraZeneca, um, no, the Pfizer one, um, and the Moderna one, 95% effective efficacy. So herd immunity, if the row value was three, we'd need to vaccinate about 70% of the population, just over. But if the row value is more like five, then we have to vaccinate around 86% of the population before we get herd immunity. That makes sense, all right. So that becomes a key area to get herd immunity, just around here. And you take vaccine shyness and fake news through to anti-vaxxers and they're running at about, in Britain, 25 to 30% who refuse to have the vaccine in the first place. So if that's the case, we'd be looking at not necessarily stopping transmission, be lowering it, but helping the individuals that are vaccinated rather than getting complete herd immunity. That becomes an incredibly important area. 
but some of those other the uh, the Oxford AstraZeneca that's only around 65 percent perhaps efficacy in that ballpark range so if we came up to a road three or four you need 90 percent vaccination rate to uh, it's not nearly as good Okay, COVID-19, what's the goss? A bit of lighting up a bit now. Um, and I find this terrifying, actually. I th thank you as a result of giving this talk. I don't have um, Facebook or anything else. And so I started looking up fake news. I called it a face news a fake news pandemic. Facebook and news was both profit on the spread uh, and the um, uh, online channels make about $1 billion a year that's US from these fake news channels, fake news channels, uh, one billion dollars. And the study was shown 430 pages had 45 million followers, fake news. And Facebook tools are used to spread even more. So they make even more money, both the platform and the users of it. And last year, Facebook promised no user or company should profit uh, from false information about immunization. And of course, Trump carried on going. It was only when they probably got worried when he left that the new administration might divide them up that they suddenly stopped. Fake news is a real problem. And um, so, for instance, headline, Pope Francis shocks world, endorses Donald Trump for president. Um, uh, WikiLeaks confirms Hillary, all rubbish, confirms Hillary sold weapons to ISIS, then drops another bombshell. Um, it's over. Hillary's ISIS email just leaked and it's worse than anyone could have imagined. Uh, Hillary is disqualified from holding any federal office. Uh, FBI agents suspected in Hillary email links found dead in an apartment and murder suicide. Fake news on Facebook for the top 20 election stories in August had 8.7 million uh, followers. Mainstream news had 7.3 million. I just find it staggering. They have a playbook. They have a so-called playbook. COVID is not dangerous. Vaccine is dangerous. Vac vaccine advocates, health officials, governments cannot be trusted. They're the key points that keep coming over. And they try converting vac vaccine hesitant people to committed anti-vaxxers. There's money in it for them and or fame in it for them. And they even have aunt question and answer sites so they can give information. Uh, this person here, he's got half a million subscribers and saying they, that's, that's officials, are hoping the human race becomes reliant on vaccines and antiviral medication. In a recent candid interview, Bill Gates outlined that despite the comparatively small threat of coronavirus, he and his colleagues don't want a lot of recovered people who have acquired natural immunity. They instead are hoping we become reliant on vaccines and antiviral medication, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it's um, all rubbish. Um, the truth about disease viruses, they were both created by the pharmaceutical industry who uses the flawed germ to sell medicines, et cetera. Just goes on. I've never seen so much rubbish in my life before. It changes your DNA. You won't be human. You won't be of the creator. You will be a genetically modified organized organism. You can technically be patented. Isn't that scary? You might not be a person of patency. It's likely you will not be around to worry about that mRNA vaccine. Um, it, it goes on. No need for gas chambers. Vaccines will do the job slowly and quietly. Nobody will even know. It's a holocaust. Um, growth since July, 1 million. That's just growth, 1 million. Current followers, just short of 20 million. These are all the platforms here, and these are the people using them. It really does threaten democracy overall, but even more so whole health platforms completely. Uh, there's one lot of people reported 500 and, in a study, 569 totally false, um, new, uh, sorry, 900 totally false news. When they notified the platform, platforms, 2.3% of them only were removed. 2.3% only were removed. They're not the slightest bit interested in doing it. And they link COVID, 5G, microchips, and vaccines. So 5G, microchips, vaccines, they have all these showing it's a great conspiracy to track and control the world's population. There's a staggering number of people that believe it. Absolute staggering. Okay, we now have 
7th of February, perhaps around that, this is the Johns Hopkins, uh, 105 million or so cases uh, worldwide, global cases, um, deaths, maybe 2 million. And so the main countries, you see there. And I've gone to the other end of the list, uh, New Zealand at 25 deaths, Taiwan much larger than us, only nine deaths, and these had no deaths. And this is the other end of the spectrum, just to show that. Uh, in the USA context, just using that, 331 million or thereabouts. Pre-COVID deaths per year is around 2.8 million deaths a year. People die, 2.8 million, which is just around 0.9% of the population in the United States would be expected to die each year. And um, there's 461,000 COVID deaths, which is 0.14%. Just want to put that in perspective. Infant mortality rates, 0.56% per live births in the States, life expectancy almost 79 years. Leading cause of deaths, for instance, in the US, 659,000, cancer 599,000, COVID's here. I'm just putting in perspective, car accidents, 38,000. Put in perspective you don't hear ongoing the news about the ongoing rates here. Once again, I'm not saying COVID's good at all. It's caused chaos, socio-political. Um, but in perspective, it's another one that we don't know so much about, which is frightening. And um, it um, hits the news media far more. Uh, local risk, we won't spend time on that. Um, but we do need to manage an outbreak. Um, as a case, a cluster or a community level transmission, always evaluate, evaluate. Masks, of course, ongoing um, are key. Uh, which type of mask? I won't spend time on this either. I think I've done it before. Uh, homemade surgical mask, N95. They all help. They all reduce risk, um, some more than others. We know large droplets, when we cough, go a long way, and almost any covering will stop them. And um, we know the very fine particles will also take time and they'll drift over here as well, the very, very tiny viral sized particles. So protecting yourself, and this is relative over three hours, with a reference level of 100. If we've got, this is a mask type here, if we've got a tea cloth after 100, uh, tea cloth mask, after, starting with 100 after three hours, uh, 33 particles leak through the mask. Surgical mask, 25 leak through the mask. N95, only one leak through the mask. So if you've got a, if you need to breathe in 50 to 100, depends how many were in front of that mask beforehand. And protecting others, the outward protection, um, we come back to 90 for the tea cloth, 50 and 30 for the relative effects from 100 reference level of 100. And hand hygiene, never to be forgotten, nor social distancing. I spent ages making that, Kathy. And nor social distancing. <laughs> and social distancing, of course, stops the transmission. And similarly to that exponential growth, uh, one person infects in five days, two and a half people. So the row value is two and a half. After 30 days, we have 406. But if one person with the row value is reduced to 1.25 by mass, social distancing, et cetera, only 15 people will be infected. So the exponential growth, one person to 0.6 people after 30 days, only two and a half people infected. Other causes of death, um, which, as I was saying before, we tend to think infectious diseases, 26%, um, cardiovascular, 29 cancers, injuries, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, respiratory infections, AIDS, diarrhea, TB, malaria, there's large, large numbers. Uh, six diseases account for 80% of the infectious diseases in the world. Similarly, uh, antimicrobial resistance uh, is set to rocket by 2050, maybe 10 million a year. We're just sitting on 2 million at the moment, just over 2 million with, with COVID. So just be aware of these other things, not meaning to belittle it up. In some ways, we're lucky. Seasonal influenza may have about 0.1% mortality rate, one in 1,000, mainly in the elderly. COVID depends on which age group we look at. Might be 0.01, so that's 1 per 10,000 to 2 per 1,000 in the 0 to 54-year-olds. 
but it starts rising exponentially in the 50 year olds, 60 year olds, 70 year olds, 80 year olds, 90 year olds, as does average death rate too, of course. SARS had 10% mortality, H7N9 influenza 30%, Middle East respiratory syndrome around 34, 36%, H5N1 bird flu 60% mortality, Ebola 90%. We were lucky, <laughs> clearly not, but in some ways, if it had been the other two coronaviruses, SARS or MERS, um, much, much worse than this one. Reviewing emerging infectious diseases, I'll just go like the clappers now. Um, there's old diseases returning or increasing from endemic areas, malaria, measles, dengue. Um, new diseases keep emerging all the time, uh, whether it's MERS, Ebola, Zika, bird flu, swine flu, et cetera, keep emerging. New forms of old diseases, uh, that we catch from others. So mad cow disease, CJD, and multi-drug resistant TB, um, multi-drug resistant gonorrhea. Um, gonorrhea is now um, in at least 10 countries uh, resistant third generation keftriaxone even. And so in all these countries. So there's many others emerging at the same time. I may have shown this one before, just to lighten up. Um, we get these um, forms that come in from you, you and your surgeries. This one rather like, lives next door to a monastery, doesn't seem to help. STD check again, please. It's always rather like, I'm sorry if it causes offence to anybody. Um, <laughs> uh, the world, much larger population. We travel far more. Perfect conditions for sharing and spreading infectious diseases. So infections used to be mainly epidemics, which we're well familiar with. The smallpox, plagues, TB, syphilis, etc public health, sanitation, and vaccinations largely mitigated those risks, that smallpox, largely mitigated the risks. But these horrific numbers we've been brought up to know, really horrific numbers, 75 to 200 million plague deaths in Europe. Uh, post Columbus, the population in South America reduced by about 90%. Uh, smallpox deaths just between 1900 and 1978, or there are about 300 million to 500 million until it was vaccinated off the world. Spanish flu killed about 50 to 100 million. HIV aged about 35 million. Um, so um, that's the first vaccination. Um, Edward Jenner, who's credited with saving more lives in the world than anyone else, that's the first smallpox vaccination, even though the Chinese were using a variolation procedure a couple of thousand years earlier. These have been a miracle, the vaccinations, as I might add, is the mRNA vaccines for 95% efficacy, such like really, really, really changed our lives. We've, we've had it cushy for a long time until recently we've had a wake up call. The anti-vaxxers still cause trouble um, and the vaccine shy, it's real, real trouble actually. Um, so these infectious diseases, when we were hunter gatherers, we we're in small pods. And if this person caught measles, they might pass it on to these ones. But because they're only in small pods, they couldn't pass it on to anyone else. So when we were hunter gatherers, there tended not to be epidemics um, because there wasn't a big enough population. It was only when we started changing our whole environment and driving the forest back that we started catching things from bats and or apes and or mosquitoes because we could now no longer hunter gatherers they didn't have power lines incidentally but there's um, no longer hunter gatherers um and um they could um we changed the environment and they had to adapt or the species was wiped out so they started infecting us so there's animal um uh, animal um um was shortly grown sooner after we grew vegetables, animals grew, and it's our contact with animals, ever more contact with animals at higher numbers that have caused this. Those small uh, villages grew to vast cities. We needed vast animal reservoirs to feed those cities. And other cultures have other ways. This is wet market in China. That's the pangolin there, uh, anteater, which may be a source. So we have a lot more and a lot closer contact with viruses. Around the world, there's always ongoing outbreaks popping up in all the scientific journals and in the media quite often. Few of those become pandemics, but every now and again, one does. Most infections now we catch from me, multi-resistant bugs, E. coli, Staph aureus. 
but there are perspectives to think about. Um, maybe I won't do, um, I was going to talk on ethics, other than to say, um, well, maybe very quickly. Um, <laughs> um, so we well, have decisions to make. Should we give all our vaccines to the overseas countries that have got the highest mortality rates? Or should we divert them and treat us? We have no mortality rate at the moment. And so if you're the, um, from the ethical point of view, there's you standing there. Should you divert them to us? Well, we've only had um, 25 deaths. Or should we let the vaccines carry on to another country? Um, that's a major issue. And you may change your mind depending on where you're positioned. So if you're in that other country, you want that person to, um, to forget New Zealand and divert them here. And similarly, um, this one, this is um, Ethics 101, uh, you're up here and there are all these people tied to the railway and you'd need to throw a really large log to stop the train hitting them, um, which may be a vaccine, but you haven't got one, but there's a very large person just beside you. Um, <laughs> should you sacrifice them to save them? So <laughs> these ethical conundrums. Uh, COVID-19 risks, primarily age risk primarily age, the underlying health risks, at least theoretically unmodifiable, obesity, diet, blood pressure, diabetes, and behaviors, they are modifiable to a large extent. Um, so at the moment, we're playing a catch me if you can approach, there's an endemic in the rest of the world, and we're catch me if you can here, and we've just doubled the stakes, it's got twice as infectious. So like a Swiss cheese, there's ever more holes, and risks involved along the line. And we try and um, prevent, and or as soon as they get out, we mitigate. So track and trace, track and trace. Uh, it's prevention followed by mitigation as a risk. The unknowns, uh, virus host interactions, evolution of the epidemic, when will it reach its make, waves, seasonal, mutational, uh, does infection confer immunity, how long for? So the previous one, I've got a cousin in London who's caught it twice now after eight months. She's a first responder. So same as chimpanzees, tends to be about five to eight months when we start losing immunity. Do the vaccines last longer or less long? We just don't know until time goes on, nor treatment follow-ons. So there's many, many different types of vaccine uh, coming in. These are types of vaccine, and I won't go into those at all. These are the more commonly known ones. How effective? This one, the AstraZeneca, has just got a whole lot less effective. It's a chimpanzee virus. Now, fake news, when they get hold of that, they won't be very happy about injecting viruses into people. But the two RNA vaccines have got an astounding uh, vaccine rate. Even the Sputnik one is around 92%, as more people are starting to become a bit more comfortable with that. mRNA vaccine mRNA, messenger RNA vaccines, advantages, not only their really high efficacy, 95% or thereabouts, but also they're much easier to make because they get the human body cells to produce the, the um, proteins that uh, work to um, inform the immune system, if you will. Uh, so they're a far simpler protein to make than these other um, uh, viral vector ones. Um, so messenger RNA manufactured by chemical rather than biological synthesis, it can be changed, updated, and pumped out new form much, much quicker. Um, so here's a genetic code is taken from a COVID virus. It's taken naked and a lipid layer is put around it. It's injected into a person and the cells respond to these COVID proteins and the immunity responds. So now when we're in future, we may have contact with COVID, our immunity is already, already done there. Won't go into those. This is a UK ethics priority based on the number of individuals who would need to be vaccinated to prevent one death. I think it's really good vaccine. We haven't followed it in New Zealand, but I really liked it. Um, maybe, maybe we're, so if the group's coming up, these groups represent 99% of preventable mortality. And what they used, number one was all residents in a care home for older adults and their carers. It would save the most overall. Um, 
Secondly, was all those 80 years of age and, and frontline health and social workers. We've gone for the doing the frontline border staff. Won't be for mortality reasons, but for spreadability reasons. And then over 75, over 70, 65, et cetera. And then of course, there's the ethnic groups to think of at particular risk as well. Um, COVID vaccines, 95% efficacy. That's pretty good. But if all highly unlikely, 5 million New Zealanders were vaccinated, then 250,000, which is 5%, would have no protection. Um, it's only 95% efficacy. In other words, 5% of 5 million is 250,000. You add another 20 to 30% on top of that for people that don't have vaccines, and there's the, some practical challenges there. Um, Right. Uh, so in many ways, democracy and our freedom is being threatened by these. Uh, Taiwan used mask manufacturing ability after SARS. They pre-prepared masks, mass information sharing, border customs health, phone tracking automatically. None of these track, none of these um, barcodes and everything. They just tracked all cell phones for 30 days and, um, and detection isolation, significant fines for breaking isolation and or false uh, five to 10,000 US dollars. Um, and a genuine trust between government and community. Open and por porous borders other than the really high risk countries result nine COVID deaths from 24 million people. Pretty astounding with open borders or semi-open borders depending on the risk rate compared to New Zealand's 25. So we've got another number of decisions to make um, bad and worse, there's no easy way. Even if the population is vaccinated, there's still going to be a lot of cases. Just remember the first wave of 1918 influenza was a blip. The second wave was much, much worse than the third wave. And again, um, rinderpest virus was a bit like HIV to cattle, 1995% mortality rate was finally got rid of, caused civil wars and food shortages last case in 2001 and the world was declared eradicated in 2011 so it's the second virus only to be eliminated off earth smallpox for humans in this the fascinating thing i think is measles was a variant of rinderpest cattle virus 1000 years ago so a variant that infected humans and now the original one's gone and we're left with measles so kathy be pleased the end ones now, our actions are our future. <laughs> Include do not pick your nose and wipe it on the doors of wars. Awful, isn't it? <laughs> They're always the pessimists in this world. Um, and we all wish to grow old uh, gracefully and like the two of the happiest, unhappiest people you could ever see on this earth. We can see what's coming over the horizon in New Zealand. Are we prepared? I'm not sure. Thank you very much. <laughs> question nobody's you haven't interrupted me Kathy no I couldn't because I couldn't find I've got a couple of questions for you but there are ones that could wait till the end you see okay because you were on you were on a wheel and I thought now if I interrupt this this could <laughs> really go sideways here so that <laughs> all right we've got a couple of questions coming up for oh. you. so what, what, what we've got is what tests do you do to check if they a person has had COVID in the past Person was negative day three of symptoms, but not retested. Was very sick in November and December, and now has residual wheeze and exhaustion. Had three courses of antibiotics and prednisone. No history of respiratory problems previously. Initial in illness was after spending a lot of time in an air-conditioned hotel, but not a COVID hotel. Okay, sometimes there's no solution. So if the PCR test was negative at the time, we know that does not rule out COVID. They haven't had a past history. So unless it's something else, uh, another clinical condition, the only thing which would be around 60 to 80% sensitive, maybe a little bit more depending on the type of kit. If a blood test was done and there's IgG levels of antibodies, IgG antibodies were present on the blood test to COVID, then we would know, ah, it was actually COVID you had. It's not going to change the treatment or anything else, but it would be nice to know. And 
that I'm guessing a little bit now, that may be about 80% detection rate if the AGG test for COVID was positive. That's the only thing you could, you could do now. But PCR test earlier on um, would definitely not rule it out at all. So you go by clinical likelihood, contact with anyone else perhaps, being anywhere near anyone else that had it, if they'd been overseas. Um, but clinical uh, similarities to COVID, but that serology would nail it, but it'll miss 10 to 20% of the actual positives. Yeah. Thank you. And then this one, should, minister, should Ministry of Health be promoting elbow nudges when people meet, considering we are encouraging people to cough into the elbow area? Should the Minister of Health be encouraging? The Ministry of Health be promoting elbow nudges when people meet. Ah considering that we're encouraging people to cough into the elbow area. So they're sort of saying, like, you know, we're saying cough and then we're saying... Yeah. Like, That's a really, really... I find that fascinating, actually. That's really good. Um, I've never heard that raised before. We have to remember that by far the highest risk is shared air. By far the highest risk. It's quite hard to show. I mean, it definitely isn't at the moment, maybe frozen food and such like it's being raised, but shared air is by far the highest risk. So if you don't cough into your elbow, you'd need to find an alternative. And I'd hate the thought to say, no, they no longer encourage coughing to elbow. <coughs> Instead, that would be a far greater risk. Going on to a um, soft furnishing, if you like, your material, and uh, if, you've got a, if it's summertime, you might be cough, coughing onto your skin. I guess risk will be somewhat mitigated. You cough onto the inside of your elbow and you elbow rub with the outside. That's a bit of a fudge. Um, why not cough into your left, into your non-dominant hand, <laughs> not non-dominant elbow <laughs> and rub with the other one? I'm just making it up on, on the spot, of course. But shared air is by far the greatest risk. And the virus environmentally dies relatively fast if you happen to be having a cotton. Um, it'll die over a few hours, 24 hours, maybe up to three days. The trouble with this new infectious, 50% more infectious, infectious dose must be a lot lower. Really good question. Yes, it is. And then we've got what research has been done for the treatment of COVID? Tons, tons yeah. of research. I was going to have done a whole lot of reading before this. I thought I can't make this any longer. <laughs> um, we know though that anti-inflammatories seem to work well, in some ways surprisingly, dexamethasone for instance, um, seem, and the seriously ill people seems to reduce their chance of mortality. Primarily because at the beginning I said there's two phases to the infection. One, the actual infection phase, and then the secondary inflammatory phase. And so that's where the anti-inflammatories actually seem to um, increase your chance of survival. As with the immunocompromised, they're often more prone to infections and so dying. But with COVID, a number of them seem to be less prone because they have less inflammation. And so maybe a 10% reduction. There are one or two other promising ones as well, treatments um, of the, well, there's also oxygen, of course, uh, for the saturation rate, but there are one or two other chemical, which I'm not up to date on, um, but there's some smaller. I did have the issue in one of those African talks, having an extremely capable, as asked, had I seen this video, it was five minutes long by Dr. So-and-so African name, which I couldn't pronounce. And could I listen to it? I did. I think it's the most, it put Trump to shame. She was absolutely brilliant orator. She was apparently a GP and saved thousands of lives from COVID and didn't know why the West wouldn't supply, uh, I think it was azithromycin and a couple of, and um, uh, hydroquinone and something else, uh, chlor yeah, hydroquinone and something else, and which has been completely proven not to work. And she said it with so much utter conviction. Um, I'm sure, and the most watched video, and everyone was thinking that the damn industrialized world, why don't they? Here's proof that it works. 
my comment at that stage, I'm just saying that in relation to other treatments, of course, my comment at that stage was, I remember when HIV came out, there were all these very uh, heads of tribes and such like saying, have sex with the virgin and it protects you from HIV and all this sort of thing and various other treatments, absolute hogs wallop that people tend to believe like fake news, uh, the people in power or that come across convincingly. Sorry, that was a bit long on the answer. <laughs> No, I like the hog's wallop. <laughs> <laughs> um, we've got, how long does the virus stay in the air? Ah, it's another good question. How long does, if I was a smoker and I coughed, the large drop that's come out with all the smoke in them and would land really quite fast. Some of them would go quite a long way because like a tennis ball, they go a long way when I cough. Unfortunately, the very fine water vapor droplets go out. And then when the humidity is a bit lower, then the water evaporates off and you're just left with the naked virus and they will not settle. So something as light as that will not settle. It just stays like smoke in the air. And smoke will be on a par for size. And how long does it take for smoke to settle? It doesn't. Oh, the good news just keeps coming, Bernay. <laughs> <laughs> Open the window. Don't get on a lift. <laughs> Even if MIQ say you must do. <laughs> but if the PCV tests are not picking up cases which turn out to be historical, how can we be sure these people are not leaving isolation infected with COVID? We can't. No. That's the first thing. So we can reduce the chances at every step of the way. And that's what we're doing. We're reducing the chances. And the isolation times essentially two incubation cycles being the 14 days. But the trouble is, if somebody catches it from somebody else, whether that initial person had symptoms or didn't, and we know the PCR test can miss a significant number of them, if somebody else catches it, uh, towards the end and their PCR test is negative and they go out. And we know without symptoms, they're less likely to spread it as much, but they still can. It is only a percentage gain, nothing else. I shouldn't say gain, it's deadly serious. Um, but it is the, the more people we have coming in and now that it's 50% more infectious, the more likely we have. And the main barrier is people. And, um, and people's habits and cleaning. That's why I mentioned the, the lapse of the fogging, which I can't comprehend why it's not done routinely. 100% um, sterilization fogging, but um, only costs about $20 a room for the sterling cost, um, but in 40 minutes. But um, no, we, we cannot eliminate it. We cannot eliminate the, um, the test. We can't make it any better at the moment. And so there's, it's just a percentage game, as was um, the PAP testing for cervical cancer. It's a percentage risk reduction with behavioral links brought on top of that. But we know guards have had intimate relations with, with staff. And people will be human along the line. I'll just pop out, share a smoke to whatever else. <laughs> Um, should so in terms of the isolation for the facilities again, is should we consider having motels with opening windows at these managed isolation facilities? Absolutely, an open window, to my mind, makes good sense. Um, many hotels, uh, you cannot open the window, and so I know the last time I stayed in one just three weeks or so ago in Auckland, um, you couldn't open the window. Actually, that one you could, but one before you couldn't. And quite often, did I say I turn off the air conditioning because of the noise in the room coming back? If I was a smoker being a surrogate for virus, then it's not going to get sucked away in the air conditioning. Um, do you have any idea about the potential for future chronic disease and recovered patients? Uh, as I think I had on a footnote on one of the slides, we're just starting to learn about it. Most diseases, even Campylobacter, when I say even, Campylobacter is a good example. There's a small proportion, one in 2,000 in the case of Campylobacter, go on to get Guillain-Barre syndrome, for instance, one in 2,000. And so in the Havelock North 
outbreak of Campylobacter. There were thousands of, of um, Campylobacter cases from contaminated water. Um, we're having a bit of trouble with contaminated water in New Zealand at the moment, nitrates and lead and such like that, but that was an infectious one. Campylobacter, there are a number of cases of Guillain Barre. Now, if there had been millions of cases of Campylobacter in the world, then of course you get large 100,000 Guillain Barres every year. Salmonella, a number of people get reactive arthritis a few weeks afterwards. So there are emerging chronic fatigue and a number of other conditions as the long COVID type. Um, and the data is getting better and better put together on those now. Be awful to, for any individual that happens to get it. Think you've got over it. And then you get these long-term sequelae. Absolutely. And then this one here says, I work in residential care. What is your opinion about people returning to work, to work? Should we delay their return? So I'm wondering if they're referring to people who've come through managed isolation. I think possibly, but even both. I mm. think we have to draw the line somewhere. And that's why I would like to see the very, as the British did, uh, joint venture um, to save the most lives, we should use the best vaccine, which is the Pfizer or Moderna, 95% efficacy, and at least offer the vaccination at an absolute minimum. There's a tricky one of staff that refuse, um, but offer the vaccine to all residents plus all the uh, associated carers with them. That's by far the highest mortality all around the world and in New Zealand, that's where we had the highest mortality. So returning, yes. I think it's an interesting question. If they've come back from overseas, if they've had negative, been through MIQ, had negative test, um, once again, it's a really low chance that each facility would have to make up its mind. Do we give them another week um, or another few days just to make sure they don't develop symptoms knowing that, um, they are, if they have no symptoms and you want to be having a higher index of suspicion for symptoms, and I suggest also wearing an N95 mask, well, ideally I'd always wear N95 masks because they can be reprocessed really cheaply, but um, having a N95 mask or your own one that or two or three that you just keep three days and if you're using your own one, the virus will die over, say, three days. You can reuse it for yourself. You wouldn't want to do it for someone else, but reuse your own. Um, and so if, if you came through managed isolation, I think it would be good for a rest home to give them an N95 mask for, for a week, perhaps just to even reduce that small chance even more because the consequences are so, so high. Mm, it's a good question. I hope that sounds like a good answer, Ben. I'll go yeah. with that. <laughs> <laughs> I'll agree. And, and extra care to hand hygiene, of course, just to um, keep, keep that up. Of course. <laughs> Um, how often and or when do you think we need to do the testing within the 14 days isolation period? I think it's pretty good at the moment. You can't do it all the time. So you do it three days, a minimum of three days before you arrive here. Um, the sun I've got has just um, arrived. Pretty tricky to, to do it three days, get a swab done, tested and still be within the three days of when they arrive here, which took um, 30 odd hours to get here. Um, so it was quite finely tuned. Then when you get here on the day of arrival, you've got another swab taken then. And then three days later, got another one. And I think there's a day 12, have another one again. Um, that's, I don't think there'd be any value in doing more than that. Um, it's just the test doesn't, it picks, it never picks up 100% in spite of some claims. In the laboratory, we can take one COVID virus and it will always detect it sort of thing. Um, but in practice, for whatever the reason, maybe the swab collection, a whole lot of other reasons, it's in practice, it's significantly down on what an ideal situation theoretically could or should be. Thank you. Right, we've got four more questions and then I think that shall suffice for this evening. Yeah. All right, <laughs> first up, we've got with regarding to fogging for sterilization, are we set up for this now in New Zealand and how realistic is this for most work environments? For which for sterilization? For 
for fogging. Oh, fogging. Um, <laughs> the um, for fogging, there's a with a hydrogen peroxide based fogging. Um, the uh, I think Waitemata uh, Waitemata DHB has I think six uh, foggers. They were the first generation foggers. They take a few hours to do. They've been used a little bit in quarantine, I think, but they're quite slow. I have a conflict of interest. There's another machine um, uh, through a company, Sani Pure or Alta Pure, and that does it in 40 minutes. Uh, Ryman Healthcare have them uh, in New Zealand and Australia. Um, so, yeah, a, my ideal would be, and I can't see why it doesn't happen actually, why MB wouldn't use them in hotels, quarantine. And at some stage in the future, when we maybe don't have quarantines and such like, they would then go to DHBs because there's around 600. The last data I think MOH put out was 2017 is uh, stats. There's about 644 outbreaks a year in New Zealand. So mainly norovirus, for instance. And that does last in the environment for two or three weeks with incredibly low infectious dose. And also for, so <clears throat> thinking of rest homes that would completely sterilize and does sterilize um, all those rooms towards the end of an outbreak and just go through and sterilize the dining room and every and the individual rooms. Same as people in the hospitals and all rest homes have had uh, carbapenemase producing enterobacteria, say the CPE or ultra, ultra antibiotic resistant ones. If they are discharged or die, leave for whatever the reason from a hospital and or a rest home, you could completely sterilize that room to remove those microbes from that room. Um, so, and that only uses the first generation one used 35% hydrogen peroxide. The second generation one uses 0.88% hydrogen peroxide and 0.18% per acetic acid, which is a chemical in equilibrium with vinegar, acetic acid. And at the end, it just sucks all the fog in and um, turns it to carbon dioxide and water. There's no, no chemical residue at all left. And um, so the EPA in the States where it was developed say you can sterilize vegetables with it and you don't even need to rinse them in water before you eat them. It's, uh, there's no chemical there at all, which of course means it doesn't promote antibiotic resistance. Residues seem like a good idea, but they promote antibiotic resistance. Thank you. Can you explain a bit more about reprocessing masks? How do you do it with what? Okay. The only, once again, I say I've got this conflict of interest uh, through Sani Pure, Alta Pure, um, but <clears throat> Duke University in the States um, put the N95 masks through 50 repeat cycles. Uh, the masks are just, um, uh, uh, it's on the website actually, Sani Pure New Zealand, S-A-N-I, Sani Pure New Zealand. But it, they put, uh, you can put a thousand, two thousand masks just strung up uh, in a room. And if you put a thousand masks in, it costs around 16, 20 dollars for the sterilant and you fog it in, it's just hydrogen peroxide, very low quantity plus this parasitic acid. And in 40 minutes, it's um, the actual sterilization time, something like eight minutes. But it, by the time you have um, re, uh, it takes 40 minutes to re um, dehumidify all the fog. They're all totally sterilized. Duke University did it 50 times and there's no change at all in um, in the efficacy of the masks. The high concentration mass, the, uh, the first generation fogging, it, the, it melted the um, elastic bands and after five times it, it mucked up the filtration ability. So I think we've got endless masks in New Zealand. If we repost them, it costs 1.6 cents each to do a thousand and 0.8 cents each to do 2000. In other words, the money is nothing saves landfills, half the mass that are bought, and you will have heard um, the MOH were left with, I think, $35 million worth of bang PPE equipment. Ideally, the masks are recommended with the background to thinking how many have we got and cost, but essentially they're cost-free if they're reprocessed. It's just a nothing. And, um, 
you could say it's like using somebody else's pillow without washing or people say doesn't it like using someone else's underpants you go to a hotel and you're quite happy putting your head on a pillow after it's been laundered this is sterilized it kills all known microbes um u.s military use it for bioterrorism decontamination every known microbe at a level of six log 10 which is a vast amount Okay. Do you think it is okay for GPs, nurse practitioners to work in managed isolation facilities and then come back to work with patients in their practice the next day? That's an interesting question. In practice, I think yes. Um, it's like I say, if they're not there, who's going to be there? And it's a balance of risks. And so when I come back to seeing the patients, if they're symptomatic, then clearly they'll know they've been in managed isolation. And so if they're symptomatic, they would remove themselves from the workplace straight away. We know that just before symptoms, you can be quite infectious. Um, but we know maybe um, 10 minutes or so within two meters, and that's about the length of a consult. So maybe to see a few more patients, but quicker. <laughs> but often the patient is not within two meters and or you could just bear that in mind and or open an external window all these things will mitigate risk and you may or may not wish to wear a mask for the first few days um, just to mitigate that risk even more mm -hmm. absolutely what is the latest info on the side effect profile of the messenger rna vaccines on those high risk elderly patients the latest that I'm aware of is, I, I put this two ways, I'm not aware of any deaths at all that have been related back. We always know, I think there's Norwegian ones, oh, there's four people died after vaccination. But of course, when you're in your 80s, there are a number of people die in any country every month anyway. Um, so nothing yet has been attributed that I'm aware of back to the vaccine, any mortality at all. It's not saying it hasn't happened, but none has been attributed back. As opposed to, even if it was one in a million, if they're high risk, they may have a 14 per 100 chance of dying of the infection. So it's a relative risk we have to think about too. Um, so I think totally safe. The messenger RNA, has a particular benefit in that it is very fragile itself. I'm talking about vaccine safety, um, very fragile, and it cannot go back into the nucleus. It's one way it comes out of the nucleus. There are some more theoretical issues about could we have messenger DNA for parvovirus and HPV and such like, which are DNA viruses, theoretically they may or may not be able to go back into the nucleus but messenger rna um, can't go back in the nucleus does its job and very shortly uh, disintegrates so as far as the risk to our dna i think it's zero as far as risk to the patient um, somebody who had a hypersensitivity reactions allergies there'll be a major caution on because some people have had major allergies with some of the vaccines have had a major adverse event I'm not sure of anyone dying of it but they've had so that would be a, a think carefully what uh, monitor carefully if they're known but otherwise I, I think very very safe and um if you were a gp would you recommend giving the vaccine to pregnant women uh -huh. that's also interesting there's always anything to do with pregnancy as time goes on, we will get more and more information. And that's one of the advantages of New Zealand holding off. As far as I'm aware, the everything I've read, that increasingly cautiously, because it's not a live vaccine, there's more, um, uh, more concern about live vaccines with pregnancy. And no one's ever going to say it's 100% safe from pregnancy. But once again, the relative risks there's slowly increasing data of people that didn't know they were pregnant and such like, increasing data to show there seems to be no issues with it at all. In time, we will know more. If somebody was pregnant in New Zealand at the moment, 
without any community transmission, you could perhaps hold off if vaccine became available until either we should have a large community outbreak and it looked as though it was in your area, then you'd make the decision, should I vaccinate or not? Remembering also that most, it's gonna be that first few weeks that are probably the higher risk first trimester and the mortality rate is low for that age group and, and it seems to be for children essentially zero. Um, but if there's, if there's to be a major outbreak, personally, I think on um, the information I have, most people seem to be leaning towards saying it's all, it's very likely to be safe for pregnancy, but the absolute proof's not there yet. Thank you. And here's your last one, which you might not guess is coming. So this could be good. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds interesting. <laughs> Is, but it's true, but I think it's got a reasonable answer to it. So um, with the with the sand pure frog, is it toxic to animals? Um, as a <laughs> microbiologist, I would never want a human to go into a fogging room and breathe it, because although we tend to think of our lungs as sterile, they're not, and I'm very keen on the microbiome. But no, that concentrate, we can put three to four percent hydrogen peroxide on our skin. And this is 0.88% hydrogen peroxide and 0.18% peracetic acid. It's um, so animals, I wouldn't want to put them in a room with it, but um, I wouldn't like to, to hurt the poor little duffers on their lungs. But um, I, if that's what you're thinking of, putting them in the room, but uh, there's no toxic residues at all if you're to um, do the room afterwards. It does kill things like dust mites and such like, so it would have a fairly deleterious effect on fleas, but I wouldn't like to put um, put dogs and cats into a room to deflea them. I think there'd be much more appropriate ways of doing it. <laughs> also, the fog at that level is safe for electronics too, so you can leave all the electronics in there and um, it doesn't bleach anything either. Mm -hmm. Fantastic, Ben. Thank you very much. As normal, you didn't fail to impress us all. Um, yeah, no, people are just very grateful. Loved the update, loved your enthusiasm. Great to just find out where things have got to and um, informative. Yeah, lots of positive feedback this evening, Ben.